you, Barbara, um, and uh, thank you to the organizers, all of you for inviting me and all of you for being here. Um, before I start, I wanted to say, you know, I've been really interested in um, one, of, one of the best things about a meeting like this is the face-to-face -face meetings and discussions and actually talking about real issues like what do we do about these problems where there's not, there's not an obvious answer. Um, and I know that there's been some, you know, we've all uh, agreed that in some sense we're preaching to the choir. We've all, we, we all are in agreement about um, what the problem is of um, diversity of, of research participants. Um, and we might not know what the answer is. My talk is going to, in some sense, repeat a lot of the points that have already been made from a slightly different angle, and there's a note of pessimism in there that you'll see. <laughs> but, I, but before I started, I just wanted to mention that I'm quite optimistic that all of us are here, um, and that, uh, that, that there is, I, I do feel like there's a, there, there's a, Mike, there's a there there, just so you know. Um, that actually, I think, we, you know, I, I have a feeling that, that, that we're making progress, and that the very fact, I think that one important thing is that the very fact that all of us in this room are doing research mindful of, of um, the weird problem and, and its correlates um, is, is really the first step in, in, in solving it. So, so what I want to talk about today is um, the human cognitive phenome. You could also say the human psychological phenome, the, the human psychological behavioral phenome. I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean there. But of course, by that I mean when, 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 when biologists talk about the phenome, it's in contrast to the genome, and the phenome refers to all of the manifest traits of organisms and indeed groups of organisms within societies. So we're talking about things like um, how the brain is organized, um, how the brain and the body are organized, how information flows through the brain, how it manifests in behavior, culture, language. Every single bit of that, in my view, um, should be regarded as part of the phenome which of course varies across individuals, and that's one of the things that we're interested in. And I put this picture to start with. This is a photo that I took um, during field work this summer in June. And so I've worked, I'm not going to talk a whole lot about my field site, but um, I want to use this as an intro. I, I, wor I work in several small communities in um, southeastern Ecuador. These are Native American communities. The language is Shuar. And um, these are uh, some of my friends, Andres, I don't know if this pointer works, Andres, Fermin, Gregorio, these are all people from a small um, Shuar community known as Chinimpi. And there's a ceremony here where um, uh, the local uh, Ecuadorian local government gave a soccer field to the village. So we're sitting here on the soccer field, this newly plow plowed soccer field. And that man standing up there is the mayor of the town of Palora, which is the municipality which donated the soccer field to the village of Chinimpi. And he's talking um, one of these. Uh, so in these contexts, there's always a very elaborate dedication ceremony. It lasted for a couple of hours. He's making a speech, um, a very nice speech, but also you know, there is a political element to the speech. He's being photographed. By, um, he's being filmed by the local news media as well as some photographers from his own mayor's office that's going to put pictures of him dedicating the soccer field up on their own web page. So why do I put this up here? I'm going to be talking about social cognition. In particular, I'm going to be talking about what's sometimes called theory of mind. So um, sensitivity to what others are thinking, feeling, their motivations, their intentions. And um, using that's using some of, some of that's inferential, some of it is. Um, via empathy and other kinds of mechanisms, how we make use of that in our own decision making and so on. And so what, I, what, I, what I'm illustrating here is um, the complexity of what we, uh, of that kind of ability that we use in psychology. We use a single kind of term, either mentalizing or mind reading or theory of mind to talk about that. But what we're really talking about is kind of a complex manifold of social cognition that uses lots of different information and that um, what my, one of the points I want to make is we know actually relatively little about how that, is, that ability or that set of abilities is manifest in the real world. Um, because most of what we know is, first of all, through 
particular cultural context in the West, but also through experimental tasks and so on, rather than actually looking at how it plays out in the world. Um, and um, we don't even really know if it's a thing. Um, to again use the, the language of thingness and, and there. Um, you know, we, we, we use these terms, but we don't know a whole lot about the, um, the ontology of, of, of social cognition and how it partitions into different abilities. So these people here, you know, as they're sitting here, they are making inferences about what he is saying, um, including interpreting everything that he's saying through the lens of knowing that he's the mayor of this town, um, you know, his own personal relationships with them, but also what, um, what skin he has in the game of the dedication of the soccer field. Um, and there's a huge area of, uh, you know, uh, uh, of research looking at how we interpret the speech acts of others um, and, and, and what kind of resources, cognitive resources we use. Um, lots, of, lots has been done on this, um, but when I look at a situation like this, um, I, it, it just makes me realize how much more there is to know. And that's kind of the topic I want to talk about is how, how, do, how do these abilities of theory of mind that we have studied in the lab, largely in the lab in the West, how do they play out in real world social judgment? Um, and I'm not going to be able to give you a definitive answer, but I'm going to say I think this is an important area of research. So, um, so I'm going to start, this is my outline, I'm going to start a little bit by just, again, t telling you why I think this uh, um, enterprise of cross-cultural phenomics um, is extremely important. Um, a little bit about what I think we still don't know, although I, the take-home answer is going to be nearly everything about the fundamentals of the human psychological phenome. I'm going to use an example from recent work um, that I've done in, um, in collaboration with Joe and others on um, the role of uh, social cognition, particularly theory of mind, in moral judgment um, as a kind of case study for what we don't yet know. And then I'm going to conclude talking a little bit about barriers, disincentives, and challenges for future work. So I love this quote from um, <clears throat> David Houle, a biologist, who I, I highly recommend this paper. This is in Nature Review's Neuroscience. It's called Phenomics, the Next Challenge. And um, they say in this paper, phenotypic variation is produced through a complex web of interactions between genotype and environment, and such a genotype-phenotype map is inaccessible without the detailed phenotypic data that allow these interactions to be studied. Despite this need, our ability to characterize phenomes, the full set of phenotypes of an individual, lags behind our ability to characterize genomes. And that is absolutely true in many ways. Um, and so this is a simplified kind of um, flow chart of development, right? But um, one way to think about the study of phenomics is that you have the genome and the epigenome, all the developmental resources, which give rise to the organization of our brains, in turn giving rise to cognition and behavior all of those with, with inter, you know, interplays between them. And of course, environment and experience um, plays a role um, throughout this process. So you know, we can quibble about where you set the boundaries, but roughly the phenome includes everything about our phenotypes, which includes things like how our brains are wired up, but also all aspects of our cognition, behavior, the information that's present in our brains, and so on. Um, and but the bulk of research effort, depending on how you look at this, um, it, it, certainly if you think about money that's being thrown at the problem, is devoted to studying the genome and the epigenome and brain wiring through brain mapping studies. Um, and the amount of sort of research investment that goes into actually studying cognition and behavior, of course, there's, you know, there's, there's lots of it, but there are, there's an entire human genome enterprise which gets a huge amount of funding, and there is a massive amount of funding going into brain mapping. But there is not an equivalent kind of research enterprise devoted to understanding cognition and behavior. And to the degree that there is, it has to do with bringing people into the lab and giving them batteries of tasks, not, do, not trying to map how the phenome develops cross-culturally. Um, and so what I want to argue is that I think that that should be, we should be, um, we should be doing that, and there should be a uh, explicit research enterprise towards mapping the human cognitive phenome across cultures. I think we're all participating in that, but I think that there will be a usefulness in conceptualizing what we are doing as exactly that, um, and, and putting it alongside as equally important to 
um, understanding how the genome works and is expressed and understanding how the brain is wired up. Two things which everybody seems to agree are very important. So I think there's a third component here that's missing that we need to explicitly say that's what we're trying to do and that's the, that's part of what the enterprise of cross-cultural work is. Um, so a lot of this stuff is review. We've already talked about this. Several people have mentioned the paper by Arnett. Um, where 96% of participants in this survey of um, psych journals were from weird societies. Um, Daniel and Christine and colleagues did an, another paper on developmental journals that found a similar kind of problem. Um, in, the, in, the, in the paper version of this, I'm going to do a little bit more review. Um, I, would, I would conjecture that Genome phenome mapping studies worldwide may be slightly better in the sense that the sampling may involve slightly more outside of weird populations, but those are almost exclusively in a clinical context. So things like collecting the phenotypes of people who have clinically diagnosed problems and then sequencing the genome, there has been some work like that. But, uh, and that's important work, but not the kind of thing that we're necessarily talking about here, because there we're not really necessarily talking about everyday cognition and behavior, but we're talking about clinical situations. Um, and of course, massive investment is being poured into cognitive phenomics for brain research, but almost all of that is with weird populations. So we need an equally strong effort across cultural phenomics. We know a lot, but what do we not know? So here's, here's um, three kinds of questions that I just want to th throw out as things that I would say, surprisingly, we may not know as much as we think. The first one, what are the fundamental units or processes of, cogn of cognition? Um, it, you'd think that we knew that already. Um, how are these assembled during development and via feedback with the environment, social and physical? And then the third, how are these processes deployed in real world behavior? What functions or benefits shape their evolution in our lineage? That last question is something that interests me. So when it comes to something like theory of mind, what's interesting about theory of mind that there's thousands of papers on theory of mind, including things like the false belief task, but it's not clear at all how much figuring out whether Sally moved her apple in, from basket A to basket B actually translates into something that we do with theory of mind every day. I mean, maybe or maybe not. There are studies of correlates of how much that correlates with how much you talk about mental states. There's a variety of attempts to look at the external validity of those things. But much less has been done on sort of figuring out what is theory of mind, what do we use it for in the world, um, not just how can we measure it in the lab. Um, so, Relatively little knowledge of number three. We know more about number one and, and number two, the fundamental units or processes of cognition and how these develop. Um, but those, the converging picture of those comes a lot from weird-based um, lab studies and brain mapping studies. Um, and so we've heard a lot, and this doesn't include everything that we've heard about in the last couple of days. Um, but you know, for, for we've heard many lists, and there are many, many more that we could give of whenever one of us goes around the world and does a little bit of empirical measurement of something, so a little slice of the phenome that we actually attempt to measure across cultures gives us cause to worry about the picture that we're getting from lab studies, brain mapping studies, and so on in the West. So when we've heard Mike's work on, on, on personality dimensions and the Chimane, um, there's work that we haven't talked about, but really interesting work from neuroscience about how exposure to reading over a lifetime restructures your brain, restructures perception. Um, in, in ways that you know, makes you wonder, well, what else does living in Los Angeles restructure your brain to do, um, where I live? Uh, think, uh, you know, we've heard from Steve about spatial cognition, perception. We heard Heidi's work on attachment, um, Lyra's work on, 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 on language, lots and lots more where um, every one of these things gives us reason to wonder um, how much would better understanding, a systematic understanding of the phenome across cultures make us question what we're learning and what conclusions we're drawing from things like brain mapping studies using standardized tasks in the lab in the West. We'll come back to that issue at the end. So let me turn to um, uh, theory of mind and moral judgment as a case study. So here again, there's different, there's different definitions of it, but I'm talking more, most, I, I have a very broad definition of what we mean here, which is just something like sensitivity to others' mental states. That's broader than what other, some other people would say. Um, it, it might include explicit inferences about others' mental states, but maybe also implicit use of others' mental states yeah. informing one's own behavioral decisions. Um, I won't go into the, 
discussion about this here, the, the, the cross-species comparison, but it, it appears that this is an ability that is uniquely elaborated. If not uniquely elaborated, then uniquely used in humans. But like I said, from an evolutionary perspective, there's still no clear consensus. Why? Why are we so good at this? It's probably because social, it's, it, it's a social thing, clearly. But um, is it about living in larger social groups? Is it about cultural transmission? I mean, there's a, there's a bunch of possibilities. Is it about language? Um, or maybe all of those things, but how do we know? Theory of mind has been proposed to interact with a variety of skills, including things like social learning, cultural transmission, um, communication, pragmatics, uh, and cooperation and, 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 and interpersonal decision making, and including moral judgment, um, and, and more. Um, but these, 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 are the, these are the places where this sensitivity that we have to others' minds um, probably plays a role in our everyday behavior, but we know less about how that actually works. <clears throat> um, so here's some, a few reasons to explore this. Um, we can think about cases of pathology. So as you all know, studies of autism suggest, you know, the causation here we don't necessarily completely understand, but there's a, they suggest that there's a deep importance of sensitivity to others' minds for social interaction. Um, in, in, in many different ways. Um, there's other work, for example, um, some more controversial work on psychopathy, you know, that also suggests that perhaps, you know, some kinds of impairments or differences in sensitivity to others' minds may have important functional consequences for typical kinds of social interaction and atypical kinds of social interaction. Um, there's the fact that um, intentions and agency are deeply entwined in Western moral philosophy. I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second, but the idea, there's many philosophers who would say um, to be moral is to uh, be sensitive in a certain way to uh, the, um, to, to perspective take, to take the perspective of others, to be able to put yourself in their shoes. There's a variety of theories like that that would suggest, well, if, if that's the case, then to be moral requires this ability and it, that should be true everywhere. Um, but, Anthropologists, um, including a colleague of mine at UCLA, Sandro Duranti, um, have suggested that there is substantial cultural variation in how um, and whether moral judgment depends on assessing other minds across cultures. Um, and these claims have been made from ethnographic observation um, and are extremely provocative. So um, Joe and, and I and some colleagues in uh, the Culture and the Mind Project uh, a few years ago developed um, a study to sort of initially try to take a stab at looking at variation in this. Uh, let me mention a few other things. So I, I, I've talked quite a bit about brain mapping. There's now a bunch of work done by um, Leanne Young, Rebecca Sachs, um, and others um, where people are put into a scanner, given things, like, uh, given moral situations, moral dilemmas. Um, there's, there's also a bunch of work on brain mapping of theory of mind. And those studies, um, there, there's a lot of, of details, but one sort of take home message from that studies is there's lots of overlap between the networks that are activated in moral judgment tasks and in mentalizing tasks, theory of mind tasks. Um, so a study that just came out recently looked at two different kinds of, um, there, were, there, were, there were different scenarios, but um, there were a couple different scenarios of harm violations and a couple different scenarios of purity violations, so different types of moral wrongdoing, um, and, um, the, and they looked at what areas are activated in common across subjects making judgments about those scenarios while in uh, fMRI scanner, and um, they are highly overlapping. They resemble the social cognition default mode network, so basically the theory of mind network, right and left temporal parietal junction, temporal lobes, precuneus, ventromedial prefrontal cortex, and other areas. Those are all areas that have been implicated in some way in theory of mind judgments and also are involved in, in moral judgments. So the claim made in this paper is that not that moral judgment is equal to theory of mind judgments, but that the, the same mental resources that are making judgments about others' minds are being recruited in making judgments about their actions from a moral perspective. Um, and Leanne and colleagues published a paper, the title of which was Mind Perception is the Essence of Morality. And so based on these kinds of results, you might think, I mean, there's, that seems like good reason to think that that might be true. All of these reasons are um, good reasons to guess that, that uh, 
morality makes heavy use of, of theory of mind. But what if the anthropologists are right? Um, is the mentalistic basis of morality a fundamental feature of our phenome, or is it culturally variable? And how would we know? We have to do the work to find out. Um, so a few years back, as part of the, um, this is the Arts and Humanities Research Council funded Culture in the Mind pro um, pro project at University of Sheffield. Steve Lawrence there was the PI on the project. Um, we did a set of studies, um, which I'm gonna tell you about right now. These are kind of typical moral judgment studies that use vignettes. Um, we can talk a little about some of the pro problems with vignettes, but you basically, a virtue of this is that you can go to a lot of places and you can tell people brief stories and then ask them their judgment, judgments about the stories. And I'll tell you that how we did it. And these are the different cultures that we, these are the different societies that we did this in, um, heavily oriented towards the global south, about 10 different um, places where we were explicitly trying to sample a diverse sample of non-weird non cultures. So um, we had these vignettes, and I'll, I'll give you some example of what the vignettes were like. Um, the, the total sample was 322 people, pretty broad age range in 10 different places. And there are two different banks or sets of scenarios that I'll tell you about. Um, one we called the intentions bank. And so here what we were trying to do was use the distinction between intentional and accidental wrongdoing <clears throat> um, to explore, well, how much does the person's mental state, whether they did something on purpose or not, matter for whether what, they're, what they did is judged um, wrong or blameworthy. We have four different kinds of scenarios. Um, and we call them physical harm, someone striking another person on purpose or by accident. A poisoning scenario, I'll show you an example of that, where someone poisons a well on purpose or by accident. A theft, where someone takes someone else's bag on purpose or by accident. And the violation of a food taboo, we're using that term lightly, just proscribed foods. So in the United States, this was eating dog meat. Um, the scenario involved either, hey, I've always wanted to try dog, and eating it versus someone serves you, you know, you're, you're, you're in some kind of restaurant, someone serves you dog and you eat it without knowing it. Um, and um, I'll tell you about the mitigating factors bank in a moment where we have several different kinds of potentially mitigating scenarios. The judgments were not using numbers, they're only using words. We, we have a symmetric scale where it goes from very good to very bad with neutral at the, in the middle. Why? Because this allows people, and you'll see that some people did use the good end of the scale in some cases to say this was a good act. Um, but we didn't want to bias them towards, you know, we didn't want to imply that these were all bad. So they could go anywhere from very good, kind of good, neutral, a little bit bad, very bad. And we, um, our, our DVs were three different items. How bad was it? Usually just translated with whatever the word good or bad was in that particular culture. Um, we had, there's a lot of stuff on the translate. We did a lot of work on translating and back translating the questions and scenarios. I can ask, answer questions about that. But, so we have sort of badness, um, which can be polysemous. So we also did two other measures, whether the person should be punished or rewarded. So again, all of these are bad to good, punished versus rewarded. Will people think very well of the person or very badly of the person? So also reputation. And we wanted to look at if those were correlated. They're highly correlated in the judgments, which is one reason why we're saying these are probably moral judgments because um, they entail saying it's bad, they should be punished, other people will think badly of the person. Here's, I'm just gonna give you um, two examples. So what we employed here was the contrast between scenarios. Individual participants didn't see both of these scenarios. I can tell you a little bit about how the design worked, but everybody saw one example of, say, a poisoning, one example of a food taboo. And then between subjects, we manipulated whether they were accidental or intentional. So here's the intentional version of the poisoning. Two Schwar men, Alberto and Vicente, lived in a remote village where most people got their water from a stream. Alberto got his water from another source, but there was a swampy area near the house that fed into the community stream. One day, Alberto poured poisonous insecticide into the water that fed into the community stream. Even though Alberto knew that there were instructions on the insecticide bottle that said, warning, poison, do not use in your drinking water, he poured the insecticide into the water. As a result, over the next week, many people in the village got very sick. Vicente, one of Alberto's neighbors, almost died. That's intentional poisoning. Um, and then you can contra we contrast that with other subjects got this version, which is the same at the beginning. Um, Alberto got his water from another source, but there was a swampy area near his house that fed into the community stream. Alberto wanted to kill the mosquitoes that bred in the swamp, so one day he poured insecticide into the water that fed into the community stream. 
He believed the insecticide was not harmful to people because the merchant he bought the insecticide from ensured him that it was safe, assured him that it was safe, and the merchant had always been reliable in the past. So he poured it into the water, people got sick, okay? So um, you could talk about this as intentions or knowledge. There's different ways of construing this, but one, in one version it's on purpose. In the other version, he's not intending to cause harm or he's not causing harm knowledgeably or knowingly, one could put it that way. Okay, so, um, and there's many other scenarios as well, but let me show you some of the data. So, so what I've done here is, um, I told you that there's these, on the top, for some reason I can't get this pointer to work, um, but the three green colors are the three DVs, badness, punishment, and reputation. And what I've, what I've done here on the top is graphed the difference, or, um, the difference between the judgments in the intentional and the accidental scenarios. So when the bars are going up, that means that that's the degree to which doing it uh, intentionally is worse than doing it accidentally. So you can see that the overall pattern is um, when there's a difference, doing something bad on purpose is worse than doing that same thing by accident. However, if you look over on the left, places like uh, Yasawa, which is Joe's field site in Fiji, um, Himba, Hadza, and some other places, there's m m much lower differences on average. This is collapsed across the scenarios between the accidental and um, intentional violations. On the bottom is the same data where you can just see the bars, uh, the, the light blue bars are the intentional and the dark blue bars are the accidental um, wrongdoing. So you can see that there's interesting variation, and this is, I'll, I'll show you in a second, breaking out by different uh, scenarios what it looks like. But already we see that there appears to be um, Los Angeles and Storznitsa, which is in Ukraine, on the far right there on the top. Um, those are the two, in some ways, weirdest of the um, societies that we're looking at. Um, and they also have the biggest difference between intentional and accidental wrongdoing. Um, you know, consistent with the claim that Joe was making earlier in his talk that intentionality in, mor in morality is, is sort of um, hypercognized or amplified, perhaps, in Western weird societies relative to other places. Um, here's a few other, so here's, um, here's another collapsing of the data where um, th on the top there, it, um, again, the different shades of pink show the badness, punishment, and reputation judgments. Those highly correlate with each other. And um, you can see a few things. So the poisoning scenario um, on the left is the most bad, and that makes sense. It's judged the most morally bad because it, everyone in the village is harmed by that, and it's a physical harm. Um, the food taboo violation on the far right is the one that overall is the least bad, um, and that's consistent with other literature that, you know, again, th there's no, um, nobody is harmed really except um, the person who eats the food, in the, depending on how you view that, that wrongdoing. Um, the two ones in the middle, theft and physical harm, those are the two where you see across cultures collapse the biggest difference between the intentional and accidental uh, <clears throat> wrongdoing. Um, I won't talk about the bottom one, but we also, we, we did a bunch of other measures as kind of checks of what we were measuring, including people's judgment about how much the victim was harmed by what happened. Um, okay, so, the, and this to me is perhaps the most interesting but the most complex graph. These are the interactions between the culture the scenario and um, the intent condition, high or low. So in each of these panels, you can see the four different scenarios and then the dark um, uh, triangles there are the mean judgments in that culture for um, how bad it was when the act was done on purpose and the light blue is when it was done by accident. So you can see among other things, for example, in the upper left, Hadza and Himba, if you look at the poisoning scenario, um, in both of those cases, the badness is maxed out for um, both the intentional and accidental poisoning of the well. Depending on how you look at that, that may be viewed as strict liability where you're basically held responsible for the wrongdoing regardless of whether you did it on purpose or not. Um, and you might think, well, that's just a consequence of the fact that it's bad. Um, but there are pl many other places where the um, intentional version of the act is viewed as very bad, but the accidental one is not quite as bad. So in Los Angeles, for example, if you look at the poisoning scenario, um, the 
the uh, intentional poisoning of the well is about twice as bad as the accidental poisoning of the well. There's a lot of follow-up work necessary to sort of answer the question of why we see these cross-cultural differences. Um, we know that even for extremely um, bad harm, like someone dies, in the West we make a distinction between first degree and second degree murder. So the outcome can be extremely bad, someone can lose their life, but you can still get a much lower penalty if you kill them by accident than on purpose, and there appears to be some cultural variation in that. The lower right panel in Yasawa is also interesting because that's the field site where we found that um, participants made the least differentiation, essentially no differentiation, between the scenarios in terms of whether they were on purpose or by accident. Also, very little differentiation between theft, poisoning, physical harm, and food taboo in the badness. And that's, that's interesting. We need to follow up why that is. But you'll see in a second that that is not because people in Yasawa you know, simply didn't choose to judge any of the situations because they do distinguish between some of the mitigating factors. Um, okay, last piece of data I'll show you is the mitigating factors bank. So um, we were also interested in various ways in which different kinds of things having to do with the motivations, mental states, or otherwise the situation, the reasons for action of the agent um, in, in doing what they did, how those might mitigate the judged wrongdoing. So we contrasted a case of just intentional harm. So this, a guy walks up to another guy and hits him, which is the intentional battery case. Um, we contrasted that with five different potentially mitigating scenarios. One is self-defense, so the other person's attacking him. Um, one is necessity, so this is a case where there's a fire, there's a lot of noise, the other person can't hear you, so you strike that person in order to get to a bucket of water to put out a fire. Um, insanity or mental illness. I can, there was a lot of debate about how to properly make vignettes that would imply this across cultures, and we discussed it quite a bit. I'm happy to tell you about that. Um, but here it's in a crowded place. Um, the person um, is someone who gets upset by loud noise and has a history of doing that. They get upset and they hit someone in the crowd. Mistake of fact. One person sees two people fighting and walks up and hits someone in order to um, stop the fight. But in one case, it really was a fight. In the other case, they were just playing. And then different moral beliefs. We tried to get this. This is the idea. Uh, there's been a suggestion that this might be a mitigating factor in some cases. I think our scenario wasn't so great, but it was someone who believes that weak people can bet that you can benefit weak people by punching them and toughening them up. And so a guy sees another person who he thinks is weak, and so in order to do him a favor, goes up and hits him. Maybe there's some people who think that. So here's the, here's the data. So this is an interesting thing. So this, so this basically shows, one of the things that this shows here, again, I can't get the pointer to work. But if you look on the right, Los Angeles and Storz Nitsa, in the self-defense case, those are cases where people use the scale on the positive side. So these are, again, reverse coded. Bad is up, good is down. Um, so those, those, in those cases, most the, the, uh, the subject said on average that striking someone in self-defense is a morally good act. The person is good, they should be rewarded, not punished, and that they will be thought well of and not badly of by other people. Um, those cases in many of the other cultures were kind of viewed as neutral. So if you look at the Mardu, for example, the fourth one from the left, self that's in Australia, self-defense and necessity basically completely mitigate the moral quality of the act. So you're essentially neutral if you hit, if you hit someone in self-defense. Um, you can also see that in many cases, so if you look at, for example, Susurunga and Mardu, there's a difference between intentional, hit, intentionally hitting someone um, or the different moral belief scenarios, so the darker purple bars, and then this middle set of bars, which is mistake of fact and insanity, where those are a little bit bad, but not quite as bad as um, striking someone on purpose, but there are places where there's not, that was not true. So in Yasawa, for example, there was no distinction between different moral beliefs, intentional mistake of fact, and insanity, but they did mitigate, they did forgive you for hitting someone in self-defense or out of necessity to put out a fire. So there's cultural variation in these things, including the ability to take something that some cultures would view as bad and flipping it to a good act based on the context, based on your intentions in doing it. Um, so what do we conclude from this? Well, 
I would say that there's good evidence that theory of mind, you know, some, or if you construe it broadly, thinking about the reasons why someone did something um, seems to play a role in moral judgment across societies, but it doesn't play the same role everywhere. Um, and so our initial hunch is that this has to do with cultural norms that dictate how an agent's moral status depends or doesn't depend on mental states. Um, culture by contacts interactions that we saw. I would mention that, of course, there's limitations on vignettes. So what we want to do is see, does the way that, do the, do the judgments that people made on these vignettes correlate with observations of how people judge um, in, interactions in, in, in real life? Um, and an interesting question here to me then is, given the strong, uh, in the brain mapping studies that have been done um, at MIT and other kinds of places like that, where there's a strong overlap between mentalizing and moral judgment in, in scanner studies, you know, what would happen if we took people from some of these places where they don't seem to be taking into account mental states and making the moral judgments? Would you get the same patterns in brain mapping? Um, and I think that's, there's, an, there's a question I've talked to some of you about this. Um, we've talked about methodological challenges, but that's a huge methodological challenge, right? Because we don't have fMRI um, in many of these places. You could get a grant to buy a plane ticket to bring people from Susurunga to UCLA to put them in the scanner. But then the question is, would the data that you get out of them when you're reading them a question in the UCLA Brain Mapping Center um, be valid data? Would you actually be measuring their judgments in the same way that you would if you were interviewing in, them in their house, um, in their home community? How do we do that kind of work? I think, to me, you know, Steve in his talk mentioned um, that sometimes a criticism is, well, isn't this just skin deep? Um, and I don't think it is skin deep, but I think that you know, when we're talking about what is a challenge that we can give to the psychology community to say, look, you've got to take this seriously, one such challenge would be to show them brain mapping data that um, using a task that people, that, that, that produces some kind of judgment in the West produces a substantially different pattern in people from a different cultural context, that would be something that people would have to take very seriously, especially because many of these brain mapping studies are using 20 subjects from a college campus in order to make conclusions about how the brain works in everyone. And that is indeed the conclusions that people are making about from these kinds of studies. Um, <clears throat> okay, so wrapping up. Um, you know, there's th th this, this raise, you know, this, this is, I think, like I said, just kind of the tip of the iceberg. I'm not trying to make grandiose claims about what this tells us. It's just when we did this, um, the research group that did it, we disagreed about what we expected to find about the role of intentions and moral judgments. And, um, you know, what we found is substantial variation. The reviewers on the paper um, and, and some commentators on the paper afterwards also sort of make the skin deep criticism. They've asked, they, they've said, um, well, maybe these are just artifacts, um, and it's possible that they are. You know, maybe this has to do with, um, maybe, maybe these aren't genuine differences in how people would judge these situations in real life, but have something to do with the pragmatics of the experimenter, you know, the, the interviewer uh, relationship with the participant. Um, but we need to do more research to find that out. I mean, this is the kind of thing that opens the door and says, this question has to be answered. And so I just mentioned this, I think, something that is going to be really valuable for, um, if we can do it, is to actually take the kinds of measures that we've been talking about in this meeting of cognition and behavior across cultures, and can we show, you know, are there real implications for patterns of activity in brain networks, um, and how would we know? Are there patterns of implication for things like gene expression? One assumes that if there are substantial differences across cultures in really fundamental aspects of cognition, there are going to be some differences in patterns of gene expression. Um, open questions. Okay, so um, my, my concluding thoughts about challenges and barriers, you know, we all want to break out from weird cultures. One minute, okay. Um, we want to break out from weird cultures. I, I would also mention, you know, that we want to break out from weird settings, right? In terms of, um, even if, you know, even if we're, um, interviewing people, there's a lot of studies where they are um, getting data from non-weird people, but they're doing it in the context, in a very weird context that we've already been talking about, like where the interview is taking place, just the fact that it's an interview, just the kinds of questions that are being asked. Um, 
it sounds easy, but obviously we, we know there's, there's difficulties. Um, one thing that I wanted to mention is choosing and accessing research populations. I see, you know, in the, in the, in the colleagues and, and people that I interact with, there's biases in several directions. So there, um, there's a community of people who wants to focus on small scale traditional societies, you know, and those are contested terms. Um, but then some of my colleagues in anthropology, you know, there's actually a move in the other direction to not fetishize um, and, and focus particularly on those kinds of groups. How do we choose um, which groups to study? Um, we've already talked about how to avoid biases from our own theories and things like what we measure. Um, how do we build better theories? Of what to, so one thing that I wanted to say is, you know, we've all talked about having theory-driven measurement. I think that's kind of important, but it can also mean that you know, we're looking at where the light is better for our keys, right? Because, um, you know, we may not know if we're trying to do a sort of, I mean, the thing about genomics, if you make the an analogy to genomics, um, genomicists are trying to just measure the whole thing, right? And in phenomics, in theory, we would want to do that too, to have an unbiased measurement of the entire psychological phenome um, that's theory free, because you can do that for the genome, right? Um, how do we do that? Could we do that for the phenome? It's hard, it's hard to know. Um, a really also important question that we've talked about today is how to involve communities themselves in developing and conducting research at fundamental levels. So in constructing actually, you know, getting out of the West in terms of thinking about what we actually want to measure and how we want to measure it. And then something that I myself and, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a victim of is, you know, we have to take, we take, we take these measurement tools, right, and every single measurement tool that we have has some external validity problems. Um, how do we get past the artificiality of these tools um, to, measure, to measure real behavior? So if you think about something like vignettes, a virtue, there's several virtues, and, you know, I'm not going to overly defend them, but one of them is, you know, you may never see someone poisoning a well ever. Right? So to make a behavioral observation of what would happen when someone poisons a well, you, you may never get the opportunity to compare an accidental and an intentional case. Um, so how do you do it? Um, vignettes are not, are not perfect, but there's an interesting question, um, especially for those of us who are interested in measuring rare occurrences or rare behaviors. Um, it's, it's a difficult thing to do entirely observationally. And I think we also want to be mindful, and this is my last point, um, something that I also haven't done, but I think we should talk about, is how do we collect data in ways that contribute to pan-human phenomics and genome-phenome mapping? This is something that people in brain mapping, to their credit, are extremely mindful of. So there is a phenomics project, cognitive phenomics project, in which all brain mapping studies are entered into a common database with meta tags, um, where you can search the database and you can actually do meta-analyses in the database by using tags like um, what were features of the tasks that were given, right? And you, of course, there's some art to figuring out how to code those, right? But um, what were the areas that were activated in the, and, and, and so on, right? Um, we don't have an equivalent thing for the kind of work that we do. You could imagine a database that says, I want to call up, you know, every ash conformity study, right? Um, or everything that uses temporal discounting. Um, or everything that uses temporal discounting and looks at sex differences, right? Um, a meta tag database that would do that would be, and, and, and being mindful of that when we collect the data, and Dan, you and I have talked about this idea of making a system of meta tags that the authors enter themselves at the time of submission. Um, that kind of thing would, would go a long way towards doing this. I think people in brain mapping are starting to do that more, and we could really take a, um, take a page from their book that would help out with this enterprise. Thank you so much.